of the tech panels, right? Um, so you might already, you know, miss the couch, the comfort. Oh, I cannot see anything here. So let me go in down here. Um, some of you might already think like, why well, you still here, right? It's a Sunday afternoon after all. Um, maybe you already sit back in your comfort couch, you know, seeing a real movie, not this light. Um, because me too. So um, let's do it quick. But, um, and I have a good news. I did the rehearsal yesterday and I used around like one hour to finish this one. So I will try my best to screen everything that I want to talk about this session and finish it in the time. Okay. Um, my name is Win. Um, like it said that, uh, I'm a CPO, also the CEO and a co-founder of the startup called the iKid One. Um, and as of my role say, one of my responsibilities is to building the team, right? Building the engineering teams. Um, so I'm gonna talk about how I can build the engineering team, but like the high performing one, because that, you know, I love working with the talent people. Um, how many of you guys here um, in the roles of product? How many? Yeah, I see a few, a few there. So how many of you guys uh, business guy here? One, and the rest of you is a tech one, right? Anyone to take here? No, not much, so, okay. So this is gonna prove my, I mean, this is gonna be the second talk, the second part of my talk. As you can see, like, um, if, this is, not a, this is not a bad thing, but like, um, the difference between the cultures when I'm talking with the, you know, group of Western people, everybody's gonna be like, who I'm the product guys, who I'm the technical guys, right? We are kind of like, our culture is kind of like, a bit shy, right? Um, a bit like, not, what to give a feedback or give the opinion that much. So how can I also use the cultivating the openness in, um, in Thai cultures? I mean, in Thai conservative culture as well. So um, let me use like maybe 30 seconds to promote uh, this company as well. Um, I also arranging the Rust communities here um, to promote, you know, last language. You know, any of you um, write Rust before? How many? Yeah, nice, cool, cool, a few. So you, uh, if you want to join, just please uh, scan the QR code on the, on the bottom right there. Um, we do a multiple meetup here already, but um, we didn't do any last year because I'm very busy with the um, startup that we're trying to um, run the product within this month or hope to be early next month, right? If you cannot scan it right now, you can just come to me later. Um, okay. So before we go, there is two disclaimers. So this talk is not gonna be like the how-to guide. It's gonna be a sharing of experience. Well, what is the things that work for me, right? Um, because I really believe that there's no silver blade in the world, um, depending, on, depending on the context. What worked for me, what I'm gonna share here, and it's worked for me, might not work for you at all, right? So what are we covers? Um, the first one I'm gonna cover is like, how, I, how do I manage the budget to like um, having the attractive, at least attractive conversation to attract the high performer ones, right? The second one, I'm gonna cover how we attract high performer with like, when we pay, when we definitely pay less than the big tech companies. And also, how do we retain them, right? Okay. Um, go back to the topic names. This is the first thing that I need to convince you first. Because, you know, um, is my team really a high performers? Because, you know, if they're not, is the topic's gonna be like, um, how to build a meh, engineering teams, right? And it's not a point for you guys to be here at all, right? So, please allow me to convince you that. Um, let's imagine you're building a team, right? And then you need to interview a lot of people um, to let them join your teams, right? Uh, you need to go in through a lot of resume every day, right? What is the first thing that you can, like, you know, just, you, you didn't have a time Let's say you didn't have a time to go into their GitHub uh, repository to see their code, or or didn't have a time to you know at the first phase you didn't have a time to uh, talk to them at all. The things that we skim to the resume is might be like some experience, right? The experience, what they what do they have? This experience, like what is the previous company they do? What do they do uh, before before they want to join our companies, right? So I'm gonna use that because I have like maybe around two or three minutes to convince you guys. I'm gonna use that as well. So right now, this is like the current size of the people who join my team since we are a startup and still be with us today. Um, out of the 18 people, 16 people, they're coming from the international companies. And when I say the international one, it's like a quite big one. Um, 
and please don't get me wrong, the, the Auto 5, they are good people as well. But like, as I say, it's easier, more easier for me to say like, okay, at least more than half of the people in my team right now, they are quite past the international standard, right? And out of these 13 people, five, they're coming from the big tech companies, it's a go down one. I see my friends, some of my friends out there. Woo! I go down here. Um, we, I have one people, it's uh, X-Spotify. She's coming back from the um, Sweden and then join our team. Um, and also, okay, all the rest, uh, the, uh, uh, the rest of the Sweden people, they're coming from um, Netherlands-based companies, um, Hong Kong-based companies, and also the US-based company as well. And one of them, uh, she is the former director of the front end of like the size that she has like 30 people uh, reporting as, uh, under hers, right? So if you still didn't believe me that this is like, ma, it's a meh, not like that much high performer people, um, let me use this one to trying to convince you. This is a tech stack that we use. Um, please don't just remove this site out. The rest is taken care by the back end team. So in my team, we didn't have a DevOps, we didn't have the infrastructure guys, we didn't have data engineer. Everyone in the back end team needs to be able to do all those things. So uh, they be able to, because our, the application that we build right now, we use a lot of, we have like a lot of data that we need to manage on. So we use, do, we do like, the, the guys can be able to use Spark, I go workflow, I would say workflow, um, that are big and everything else to manage the data by themselves. Also, we have like the whole monitoring system here. We follow the open telemetries, right? We have like um, tracing, certified logging, metrics measurement, the things you name it. The whole infrastructure is also we do it using the um, ISC. Um, in, uh, we use Pulumi, not a terraforming one, uh, not, not a terraform one. Um, and the guys also be able to provision and do other things by themselves. Also, we have quite, I can say like maybe quite a good CI CD because like um, when this guy uh, commit the code, right? Um, our SLS right now is to be like, the code needs to be passed everything, like in the pipeline, pass the testing, um, you know, checking, depending on everything. Within 15 minutes, it needs to be in the production automatically without the touching of the human touching, right? So all of this, how many people do we use to take care of all of this, including the business logic that you need to um, you know, working on every day as well. We use six people, and everyone can do everything here because we you know you know um, we do the ex, um, you know pair programming a lot. So we trying to make make people you know some people when they join us, some people like have expertise on DevOps. Um, some people may like like have expertise on like um, infrastructure. So we pair, pairing them and then sharing the knowledge with the team. So right now these six people can do everything that I just told you guys. Um, if, and if you still don't believe me, uh, please believe me, because you know if you don't believe me, there is no point that, that you that you're gonna talk, you sit here and then listen to my talk after this, right? So I suppose you guys already believe me, right? Then coming um, coming to the next the next session is like how can I attract and keep this brain in mind? Yeah. The first thing is very important one: the compensation. So the compensation is still the uh, most important part after all, right? Because the salary needs to be somewhat competitive. Um, and yeah, you can do it, uh, even with a limited budget, right? I want, to, I want you guys to focus here. I said like, at the first, I said like, uh, I use the word compensation, right? But here, I, I, I use the word salary instead. And the salary needs to be Somewhat competitive. I didn't see like we're gonna pay. Uh, we're gonna pay top of the market, but it need to be somewhat competitive, right? So why? Um, I'm lucky enough to um, know a lot of great people, a lot of you know talent, talented here. Um, and I ask him. I ask this guy the question like, let's say if there is like two companies, the first one gonna offer you like a hundred thousand baht per month with the guarantee bonus for like three months. And the B company is going to offer you like 130,000 baht per month without bonus at, at all. With, which one are you going to use? Uh, which one are you going to choose? Um, from my own experience, like almost 100% is going to choose the second one. That because like, you know, people want to catch, you know, um, um, bonus, even though you guarantee the bonus, it's going to come like later in the years. Um, people care about bonus, but people care more um, about the salaries. That's in, at least in my experience. So um, 
we obviously pay less than the big tech companies, right? I mean, with the startup budget, because we pay less than the, uh, the, the tech, big tech company. Our welfare is not that good. Um, like, in Agoda, we have the things called um, wellness budget, I think. When I left the company, they, they give us like 24,000 baht per year. Uh, in my current company, we have that as well, but like a lot less, like 10,000 baht per year. But, it's, but, but our welfare is covered, like um, the basic one that people need, like, um, the healthcare, right? the insurance, um, the budget that they can use to spend to going to the conference like this or buying the book or something like that. But it's far from competitive when you compare to the big tech one. Um, also, we pay no products at all. And all of these things, it makes us have like a larger budget for the salaries because no bonus and just okay welfare. Right? So we focus every budget, squid everything to use for the salary one. And also, here, let's say if you give, if you give me, um, if I have a budget for a burning rate for like, let's say one million baht per month, so instead of having the below team, the Kulilin, Kulilin is a nice one, right? I think you guys, maybe some of you guys see the gun bond, right? Kulilin is kind of like the strongest human on earth. But you know the, the above one is just like a godlike one, right? So I, I so I gonna build a small team for the people like up above, maybe except Piccolo one because you know this guy is much better. Um, like back to the budgets, right? We have like a, a, a one million baht budget instead of having like maybe twenty people paying them like fifty thousand baht per month. I gonna very very happy to build a team with five people. Each of them got like two hundred thousand baht per month instead. Why? Yeah, this is why. Because you know, it's a difference between like a great software engineer and not so good software engineer. It's not like this is generally said, right? Um, it takes one programmer to blah, 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 blah. We didn't have a time, so I think you guys might already see this one. Um, and also, the great people, we attract other great people to join the team. You know, when, when I build a team, it's not, not everyone it's the one that like going out and then invite to join uh, the companies, or or they didn't just know the companies um, from the top DB or LinkedIn or something like that. It's just like the invitation from the talent as well. And you know, when, when talent see other talents working for some companies, they're gonna be curious, like, oh, there's something might be something's there that make these great people to working there, right? So it's automatically in, um, attract people to join uh, to join the, to join the business. And for me. For me, you know, this is gonna, this gonna create a billion workplace as well. You know, imagine yourself wake up every day and then you know that today you're gonna learn some things from your college, from your peer, right? Because, you know, everyone is just like super great, right? And also, let's say even you have like some things that you need to do, you know that when you get, give these things to the guys just beside you, you know that the, the, he or she is gonna come back with a great result because they are billion, right? Other things, the other things that, uh, about the conversation um, that we use this kind of things to retain the people to see working with us. Um, let me not go into detail much, but like um, the whole the whole idea is that let's say if someone just like um, this guy is Maki Crab, right? It's like it's just a small small Pokemon, small animal in Pokemon is not good at all. If this guy, when, you, when they're joining, they're like, um, Maki Craft, they, they didn't great at all, and they get the salary of like, the salary that deserve for the Maki Craft. Let's say next year, they, he just like, he or she just like evolved to be a Gyarados. I see a lot of companies doing, doing these things called the salary ban, right? So this guy, even though like he like super great from the next year, he gonna get like 10% plus salary from what he get when he still a monkey club. So we didn't do that here. If anyone in our team just evolved to be like a Gyarados, he, gonna, he or she gonna get the salary which deserved for the Gyarados, right? Back to this one. We obviously, even though all of this one, we squid everything, every, every penny to be able to pay the salary to be somewhat competitive, still, we still pay less, less than, way less than, not, not that much less than the big tech company, but less than the tech company. Um, this is the, uh, an example. Um, we have one guy, we have one, one girl, actually the girl that like, um, the former director from in here, 
Uh, when she joins my team, I need to ask her to lower down her salary like 11 percent from from what she get because like her salary is pretty high. So but we, we didn't have that much budget, that much budget. Um, and she okay and she joined our, our team and still be with us until now. Also we have one guys. Um, this is like one of the best engineer that I have. She, uh, he's coming from Agoda and then at that time we I offers the same salary that he got right right there when when he's still working at Agoda and then. They counter the offers, right? They're seeing like um, um, 60% or something, uh, which is like obviously cannot match that, right? And he reject the Goda offers and then join us instead. So how how we can attract these people? It's coming to the second one. This is what we do. We do cultivate the culture of the openness, right? Why? Because we want to create a workplace that everyone eager to be a part of every day, and and we just believe that and we just see that to be to make the, the place like stand out by cultivating the openness can make these things happen. So what does openness mean? I still have time. Um, this is the definition from the Oxford dictionary, right? It's mean like to being honest, right? Being accept or listen to different ideas and not being limited or restricted. Right? So the first one, there is like four pillars of the openness that we do. The first one is freedom. So, why freedom? Sorry. Do you ever imagine yourself um, working, and then you know you wake up and then you feel like okay, this is just like same shit, different days. Um, the things that's called the cash that. that frame you call the employees, right? So what are we trying to eliminate? It's this case called employees. We want everyone to feel like they be able to be in control. I mean, having a control instead of being in control. And because like, we see a lot of people, even if, um, especially the new generation, like the millionaires, people prefer to work remote right now, right? Because if you, if you are millionaires, right, um, in, in, this, in this era, you need affordable. It's not. It's not affordable to you to live in the centers of the Bangkok, and then you know, just you can just like maybe take like ten or twenty minutes to go into the office. Mostly, you're gonna have like one hours, two hours out of the town, and then you need you need to take like you know round trip, like one trip for one and a half hours, and then go back from the um, office for another two one and a half hours, and it's tiresome, right? It's very tired. A lot of people prefer that and it's a lot of people even though they can I, I, I mean even though they're okay to take that time to travel to the office some some brilliant mind or some talent that I know they, uh, with their life constraint they cannot do that let's say maybe they have some some of the family members who is pretty, who is six that and, and they need to stay at the house or stay at the home to take care of them so we didn't believe in taking a control over the high performers who uh, really have like a high sense of responsibilities, right? So what do we do? Obviously, we apply the remote, 100% remote work uh, policy, which is like, I think this is pretty common right now. Um, we implement the no strict working house um, because we see like some people, um, the great one again, someone, let's say, if you have a kid, I didn't have a kid, so I didn't know, but I see like my peers and I know that, okay, he need to go into the school to pick uh, the, the kids or the children up like three p every day on 3 p.m. or 4 p.m. And with like five to nine jobs, they cannot do that, right? Um, and also, we have provided unlimited leave because, you know, we didn't care or like how many, how many days you leave, but we care on the resource that you can provide, right? So how have we, how have we done it? The first one, we use the, um, what is called GitLab Handbook. I think you guys know what GitLab, right? So uh, there are there are the companies which are doing like the remote pro remote work policy before it was cool, like way before the COVID hit, right? And the other things that I do is like I need to. The, it's the easier to talk, but it's very hard to done, right? To convince the stakeholders and higher management. So because my role is not a CEO, I'm a, just a chief tech and chief product. So I need to convince CEO and other C level as well. Um, luckily, when I joined the when I joined the uh, companies, I make it clear that if you want me to change the um, cultures, I need the power. So my suggestion is that find the power, 
find that wing that you that gonna make you be able to apply this kind of working policy, right? And what are the results? It's really nice. Um, there is some people coming coming to me and told me that because because um, their life condition is changed. If we didn't have this kind of freedom to work, uh, they might need to decide to leave. Um, but yeah, luckily that we apply this one, so they're still with us still today. Um, one thing that I really love that uh, we got feedback from the people is that they say like because we give the freedom for them to be able to decide how 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 to uh, work, right? So instead of having the work-life balance, they can doing the things that the CTO of Amazon really love. It's like um, work-life integration, and this make them feel like less and less to be like just an employee, but and then they feel like this is like part of the life instead of like you need to have life and then work separately. So, the second one, um, the feedback. Um, so what, what we do is that we encourage everyone to have the constructive feedback anywhere, anytime. So um, I think it's pretty hard, even though, even for me, when before, way before I trying to invent this one, I really love to have like in the environment that everyone can talk freely to to anyone. This uh, regard to the positions, right? Like if you're just a junior and you just join the team, you can just give the feedback to the CEO immediately, and this is like. A hardest one, the hardest uh, pillar of the cultures that we have that um, I spend a lot of effort to making this. Uh, to making this. Um, so why? Because like what we're trying to achieve is that we want to equalize us um, instead of having like the boss and the henchman or like the boss and the team, um, the managers and the software engineer or something like that. We want to make like everyone like. I mean, the boss is still there, right? The manager is still there, but they're still there because they just like have more experience. They are just they are just like better than the operation team in in the manage, management way. We still have to have me at the chief tech because my experience, I know, like maybe I'm better than them to guiding um, the direction of the companies. But we want we want everyone to be like, if I screw up one day, we want we want the operation team to just point at me and say like, okay, I, I think this is not the right way to do things, right? Um, and by equalizing these kind of things, it's create a sense of belongings for the people. It's make people feel like they belong to here, not just like not just another employers, just another work for them. Right? Um, other reason that we believe is that in the culture that rich in the constructive feedback, right? naturally, right? Um, I see in the, a lot of traditional companies a lot of time when some problem happen. People don't want to say about it. People don't want to give feedback about it because they don't want any trouble, right? But in the contrast, in the um, culture which like everyone confident or is a safe place for them to speak up, the problem that happen it's bubble up pretty quickly, and you can address it pretty quick, right? Because you didn't you didn't need to hide it anymore. Everyone want to talk about it later than just you know um, didn't notice that it's there at all. Okay, it's so the hard part. So, what do we do and how have we done it? Right. First thing first, I'm um, I make it clear because we want to. I believe this. I believe it like this. If you want to, if you want to create some kind of cultures, um, you need to get her the people who think the same as you, right? So I make it clear since for everyone who gonna join the team that to give a feedback, to give a constructive feedback anywhere, anytime, it's not a responsibility. It's not just. I'm sorry. I mean, it's a responsibility. We expect this from you. It's not just a plus. It's just a good thing to do. But this is like your job to to do that. Um, so we can cutting out any people who maybe didn't feel like um, you know confident or didn't feel like comfortable to give feedback before they even join the team. Luckily, we didn't have anyone reject our offer because of that yet. Um, we surprisingly we found out that actually, again, especially the millennia. Uh, Thai people, the young generation, they want to speak up, but they didn't have like a safe place or safe environment that they can do it. Right. Um, second one, what do we do? We encourage constructive feedback in any situation at any time. What I want to say about that is that we encourage people a lot. You know, when we when we first when I first doing that, people not everyone comfortable to give feedback yet. So what I do, I, I uh, when some people we have two kind of people. 
One group of people, maybe a few ones, starting from like maybe two or three people, they're really eager to give feedback. They really love um, to to give their opinions, right? So I always like encourage them, like, okay, this is uh, that, that's a good question. This is a good things. Even though like we have like the, in the town halls, right? And then some people just just you know put their hand up and give feedback to me because there's really things that this feedback is gonna be like helping me to um, facilitate the, meet, uh, the the meetings much better. I always say like that's good. This is the things that I want it to be in the team. And from time to time, I see people starting to um, more, con more comfortable, more relaxed to give the feedback to it also. Because if you can, if the CTO or every C-level can say like, it's good to give a feedback, why, why not they can, you know, to give feedback to their managers or the peer, it should be a good thing as well, right? Um, the other things that we do is that we do the face-to-face 360-degree feedback. So I think some of you might already be familiar with the 360 feedback, but Anonymously, uh, when the people, when the people team or maybe HR send out the survey to you guys, like in the end of the years, right? And then you can write down the feedback to um, your peer, your higher up, and maybe your team, something like that. Um, what we don't believe is that because we encourage people to give feedback, always give feedback any, uh, anywhere, anytime, right? Why, when, why when it's coming to 360 feedback? We're going to do anonymously, so we do it anonymously. Like, so what happens is that we get her people. Uh, every two quarters, we're gonna have like maybe a dinner together, a lunch together, some some kind like that, and um, we're gonna start doing the giving the feedback one by one around the table uh, at there. And the result is that this is coming, um, you know, this kind of things need to be done in the last quarters. But we didn't, I didn't do it because I was very busy. But it's not a good things. Um, I think half of the people in the team approached to me in various way and asking when are we gonna do it. So um, this, this activity is becoming like the most popular, popular activity that everyone wants to have it again. So if you're asking me, it's pretty success, right? Um, what do we do? What, what do we do? How, I mean, how do we do it? Um, when I say, when I talk about giving the feedback, I always say like, it needs to be a constructive one, right? This is another hard part. How can you give, how can you make the team giving feedback, but it needs to be very constructive. So we invest a lot to make the people know the difference between constructive feedback and being a jerk. So um, we have a guideline for that, like, like a whole page um, to, to let the people know how to do that. If some people um, didn't, didn't give a good feedback, we address it immediately. Um, we, have, we also have one people who be like that, so we approach to them that, uh, immediately, and then we say, like, okay, this is not a good feedback, you should do something like this, and yeah, he changed. Um, also, the first, uh, the first few 360 feedback um, activities, we, I'm the one who facilitate that and then make sure that everyone can give and receive feedback well, the constructive one. Um, and for sure, um, we make sure that we can create a safe environment for everyone to speak up. So if you are in the level that, that like very high in the, uh, the dynamic of powers, right? You need to be really, really calm. So, and, and when people, even though sometimes they give the feedback to you and then maybe sometimes it's not constructive at first, you, really need, you cannot be angry at all. For me, I'm not angry at all. I just point out that, okay, I really appreciate that feedback. Maybe you can do it, something, change something to something like it. It's more constructive. To so at least to make the people feel safe that even though they give the feedback, maybe a bad one, they're not gonna get screwed, right? And, that, and creating this kind of same thing is the key to make it possible to have the um, cons uh, heavily constructive feedback environment in the team, right? So, um, I think we didn't have much time. I'm gonna skip all the hours. I, I'm gonna say like, the result is pretty nice as well. There is, some, there is one guy in, the, in, the, in my team uh, just talk to me in, uh, in the catch-up session and say like, he afraid to leave the companies because he, he feel like he cannot find some another environment which is open like this in Thailand anymore. Okay, the third one, the transparency. So, if giving the feedback means you're being transparent being, uh, with your peer, right? Sometimes with your higher up as well, right? But, but this, this one is focusing more on like the information flow, especially from the top to the bottom, right? So, um, why do we do it? Uh, the transparency, let's, if, let's say, let's say, a lot of, I see a lot of companies asking people to have the ownership, right? We, we're trying to find the people who have the ownership. Um, even though they gave you some stock option, 
in the paper you own the company yes but which kind of which kind of the owner you have which kind of the owner you are if you didn't know anything about the company at all i see a lot of companies say like okay you just do your job you didn't need to worry about these things this is enough information for you to just do your job we didn't believe that at all so um, i always told to my guys that what i know you will know immediately there is not there's not going to be any secret in the in the company never ever at all the only things that i cannot do is that sharing the salary between the team i'm trying to do that but maybe not right now but i want i want to achieve that but let's see maybe that's going to be um, another talk how can i like share the salary for uh, about everyone in the companies to know you know um so what we do we make sure that we have a one truth for the whole uh, whole organization right we share everything the good and the bad we share it all um you know good Good news, people love it, right? Bad news, some, there's some question on that one. I'm going to talk about it later. Um, and I always keep the team informed and up to date because, you know, if we didn't, if we share, even though we share every information, but if like it's happened like three months ago, it's not, it's not important at all. It's not valuable, right? So how do we do it? We communicate a lot. We communicate like, like every day. Almost, like, let's say we, we're going to have like gathering almost every week to make sure that everyone knows what happens, right? Um, okay, this one is a bit tricky. So when I'm trying to apply these things, these kind of things, when I say like uh, we're going to um, sharing for both good and bad, uh, and bad news as well, right? The good news, no problems. But the bad news, I got a question a lot from the high up, like the CEO or other C-level, like, um, because they, they do it before. And it's causing a panic within the team. So I told them that, and this is what happened as well. I don't think it's gonna. I don't think it's gonna cause a panic when we give when we uh, transparency about the uh, about the bad news. And we, and this bad news is it's uh, very bad news you now. Um, so there's two times that I need to share this uh, very bad news um, because we are a startup. Sometimes we shot other cash flow, right? So we say to people, yeah, we already. Right now, our, ta our, our hand is pretty tight because, like, um, the investors who say like who, they're, they're gonna give us the money within next month, they say like they need two more months to do that, something like that. And one thing is that you need to do two things to make sure that people not gonna not gonna um, panic. The first one, having the high performing teams. What we got is that when I share, um, you know, that that bad news that we shot on the cash flow. Instead of panicking, people just coming to me. I didn't ask for anything. See, they're just coming to me by themselves with a plan and offer to help. And that's what I, I really love about working with high, high performer ones because they're really like that. Um, they didn't see the problem as the things that they need to pay panic. They see the problem that the things that they need to tackle and then go, and then go through it together. The second one is that because you're asking the people to be high performers, right, and also to be a competent, you need to be a competent yourself as well. Let's say, if you say like, oh, we didn't have any money anymore, we didn't know what to do, screw us. Yeah, we, people are gonna panic, right? But if you have like, as a management, you need to show that you're high performer, you're competent, uh, you know what to do, okay, so if what next? We didn't have the money for the next two months. How many, uh, how many money that we still have? What are we gonna do if in, in the next two months they didn't, still didn't get the money to us? So what is the, if the plan didn't work out, what is the plan B and the plan C, something like that, right? So you show that you're competent and then you show that you are already high performers. Um, I'm facing this kind of situation twice already and you know, there's no one from my team resigned because of this yet. I have when people resign, but it's not because of, of this kind of bad news. Uh, they resign to join a very big company, the US based company that's just coming in Thailand. So, um, what are the results? One thing that I want to um, mention is here is that right now the team has a complete confidence on the management team because they know that even though we are like pretty unstable, um, they know that if anything happens, they're gonna know first, they're gonna know immediately. So there's no rumors at all. There's no gossip, there's no rumors. Everyone knows that um, they know the up to date information from the management team already. And that's make me very happy on that one. And then that's gonna make you be able to focus on tackle the, uh, the problem instead, like, you know, tackle your internal team problem. So coming to the last one of the um, openness culture that, 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 that we do, um, the autonomy. So um, I see uh, some people say like you are coming from the product 
um, product I mean product management positions right so um, one other thing that product product management needs to do is to prioritize things right like like you need to so how to prioritize it you give a score some things you know which which one is have more important uh, for you to do in the list and then you throw it out because the upper management said that okay you need to do it instead we didn't do that here what do we do is that why why do we do it first again we believe that people love to having a control later than being being in control and especially the high performer ones They want a place that they can, you know, using their potential to the fullest, right? Um, if, they, if you tie their wings to the table, they're going to fly away uh, from you for sure. But in the contrast, if you empower them, they're going to make great things. So empower them. Right? So what do we do? We create the fully autonomous product team. Um, and, what, and for that, I mean, like, for me, I never say, I never, I never, I never, I never told the team what to do and how to do it. The things that I told the team, even though I didn't tell the team at all, I discussed with the team uh, where, we, where do we want to go, what is the direction, and why we need to do it. Why I use the word discussing? Because I want everyone to be able to give a feedback. Again, give a feedback back. Maybe I'm, I'm just you know, missing some point. So we want everyone to like, upgrade my high performer one to, to you know, shaping the futures of the companies. Um, we adopt the informed captain concept. This is a concept that I got from Netflix. Um, I really love it. So it's, what it means is that um, for every decision that you need to make, we're going to have one people in charge of taking decision. This regard to what position you are. If you are an expert on that topic, we're going to give you the powers to do that. So, but the highlights is on the inform word, the word inform, right? You cannot take a decision, you, you get the powers, you get the authorities, but you cannot make a decision without socializing the idea first. So you need to socialize the idea, asking the people, you know, getting the people who think, uh, you, how do you think like, uh, they're gonna make you look at every angle or the problem that you're trying to tackle right now. And then you have like the power to design by yourself without anyone can break your decisions, right? Um, and what we do is that we lead with context, not control. Like what I said before, we never, try, we, never, we never told people what to do and how to do, right? But sometimes we still need to protect the team as well. Like, again, I'm not a CEO, so I can protect just my team. Sometimes my CEO is still like telling, telling the team like, okay, you need to do this, I want this, I want it to be like this. So I always push back to the CEO. I, I, first, I told the team first, if anyone told you to do something like that, not following the orders, asking why first. Asking what do they need, why do, why do they need it to be like this. And also, um, I, told, I told the people, I told the upper management, like, okay, um, I say no to every kind of micromanagement. If you want to micromanage my team, you need to find me first. So you need to you know, protect your team anyway. And it's nice, you know, I'm gonna skip this one because the guy is already standing here, which means like i out of the time. <laughs> so, okay, coming to the last part, the really last part of, 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 of the session. So we have freedom, feedback, transparency, autonomy, right? These four things actually is combined to the last things. That actually is the key point of my talk, is the ownership. Why? Because I really believe like ownership is the most a powerful weapon an organization can have. I didn't say that. Uh, the Pat Summit, he, she is like a legendary basketball coach in, in, in the US. I really believe in that. Just imagine like, you know, I don't know what to say. Like, if you, uh, if you have like 10 people and everyone feel like the companies that they're working, uh, like, that they're working for, they are not just the employees, but they own, they really like this is their own companies. You're going to create great things and the people is not going to run away from you. They want to be there. Maybe not forever, but, but I'm for sure longer than um, to be an employer, right? Why do we do it? Like I said, it's the most powerful things. You know, people is going to give their all. Let's say, uh, compare between like you working for some people and you working for yourself. Which one you going to give? You give uh, which one you going to give more effort into it? And it's gonna um, and with high performer giving their all, they're gonna create the great things, right? And they're gonna feel like this is like where they belongs because they own these companies, not just their employees. So what do we do? Um, for those all openness, we believe that ownership 
you cannot ask for it. Again, I see a lot of companies asking people like, okay, we seek out people who have ownership. I didn't believe that. Ownership you cannot, you cannot ask for. You need to create and then give it to them. You, uh, let's imagine, let's say like, I already told these stories, right? Um, that even though you give the stocks to them, you, they own the companies just in the paper, but they didn't know anything. They're not gonna really own, have the sense of ownership within them. So how have we done it? With the feed, freedom, with the feedback, with the transparency, with the autonomy, freedom, we're trying to eliminate the cash call, uh, the role of the employees, right? Make them do not feel like the employee anymore, but they are one of the owners of the company. So feedback equalizing everyone. So everyone, there is no, no, there is no boss anymore. You can just like give the feedback to anyone. You can speak freely to everyone, right? Create a sense of belongings. Transparency. So the flow information, what CEO knows, you know as well. So you know as same as what CEO knows. Autonomy. So you have like the impact. You, I mean, your effort have really impact on the success of the companies, right? And the last one. This is the last thing that we do. We focus on the four, uh, four, four things first. The last thing is that we make them have the ownership in the paper as well. So, we, so what we believe is that everyone in the team should have a stock option, not just the leadership, but everyone. Um, what are the results? It's really nice, it's really great. I think actually I can build the whole, the whole team or the high performer because of this thing, the ownership. So the openness is gonna create a comfortable and present workplace, right? And also it's gonna create ownership which is gonna create the rest. So I'm gonna skip this past because I run out of the time, but like, um, let, let me, let's see this quote for the last part of the session. This is a quote from the Steve Jobs, right? He said like, a small team of A players can run circle around a giant team of B and C players anywhere, anytime. And yes, we can do that with the startup budget as well. All right, thank you. Uh, do I still have a time for Q&A? We can have a couple of questions. Uh, all right. Uh, so. Hey, Joel. <laughs> My hey, Wynn. Hey. Sorry, I've got some hard questions for you. Uh, that was really great. I agree with everything you said, but I've got a question for you about hiring A-plus players for all of your engineers. Does this mean you don't hire grads? We hire only one or two grads, which is like where you have like a very great potential, like, like we really see some potential in them. We have, but very small people, and we normally didn't hire the grad, yes. Yeah, I, I think that's the thing that's interesting for me, um, because the, I really want your startup to succeed, and you to scale to 200 engineers, and then for you to do this talk again, and tell me how you can scale it, because I haven't figured that out. Yeah, <laughs> you know, that's it, that's it, things so that I'm asking myself, Every day. This is, in, this is the next big, biggest challenge that I'm going to have. Scale. How can I scale it? So um, I, I, I still didn't know that it's going to succeed in, the, in a scalable way, right? But the things that I ensure that, I really, I, really, I really believe that to be able to scale, it's not guaranteed that it's going to succeed. But if you want to scale, you need to have like a very concrete foundation. So I hope that this, this, kind, this group of people, this group of 20 people, is going to have like a very, very, very strong in the culture that we're trying to build right now, to be like a foundation of what we build in the futures. But let's see, a lot of you know, problems, you know, obstacles is still there. But that's a very good question. And um, I, uh, I also have a question, and uh, that is in the case when you, uh, when you have a team already established with, uh, let's say, B or C players, and how to make it this team over time, right? With you hiring new people and etc., and become uh, A players uh, in the future. And would you fire everyone in the beginning, start from again, and do this transition and in small pieces? Uh, what, what can you suggest in this context? What is the uh, second question again? Sorry. So the, the question is uh, when you start with a team, Right of uh, high performers mm -hmm. is one thing, but when you have a team of uh, normal performers or mediocre performers, and you want to start adding uh, top performers on the on the mix. Okay, so um, first I start with the we are, we have um, it's a bit complicated because you know the, my startup is like separate from the 
uh, the companies that I join. I, I, when I first joined, the, the, that is like the mother's companies. What uh, my job is to transform the whole cultures from the very traditional one to a modern one. And then I separate, I creating uh, a new products. So, so, so uh, because like uh, these companies, um, uh, their main business is to be like a consultant and software house. They creating the um, um, investment app for a big a big bank here like SCB, K Bank. It's also our client. Um, so, so we said, so I didn't believe really to be a, a consultant and a software house. So we creating a new, a new product, and then we we get the funding, right? We we split it out. We get the funding to become a startup. So yes, we have some people from the um, from the matters companies, but we didn't invite everyone. We invite just some people, and most of them are very A plus players. Some people are just like I asking them why do you still here because they like obviously can join Agoda at any time. Like. They are really, really, really great. So um, I'm lucky enough to have them in the team. But yes, we have, we also have some average people in the team. So what, so what I do is that um, when we hiring a new people, I always towing um, the, the the team lead. Um, I always hire the people who is like, if you if you ranking everyone in your team, you need to make sure that this guy is better than 50 percent of the team to make the people you know getting better. Um, other things that that I that I ensure is that I want everyone in the team to be like. Um, like learning animals. So uh, there is one thing. There is one thing. I do the last session communities, right? Um, if you see the tech stack that I have, the main language that I use in 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 the production for the back end is Rust. Um, and I do that because it's not because like our system needs to be like overly fast or very efficient. No, not at all. We can use Go. We can use even Kotlin or Scala, right? But I choose Rust because I know that. Rust, it's have like very very steep learning curve, so it's like it's like showing the people who want to join the team like, okay, do you want to jump into this kind of you know journey to learning like one of the most like hardest language on earth? I don't know, but it's very really hard. Um, yeah. And if yes, I found out that the people who join the team is very really like learning animals. And then when when I'm with the group of the high performers, it's making people making everyone you know getting better every day. I, I really see that, and with also the pair programming one, we do the pair programming one, and then the, the, the knowledge within the team sharing a lot. So um, not just attracting A players, or not just retaining A players, we try and make the A player getting better. Also, we have some B player as well, B plus player as well. So we want them to be better and better uh, by this kind of process. Hope All that right. answers your question. All right, so since we are really out of time, so I would like to thank you. Uh, you are the exact speaker that we need to close this. So I think people would need uh, want to talk to you more. Okay, so, sure. Yeah, uh, please feel free to come yeah, to me. Yeah, but uh, we have some guests that need to move to the other locations. Mm -hmm.